So really, I suppose this is this is kind of cool for us. I was saying earlier, we we've known each other for a long, long while, but we don't really know each other that well. Yeah. We've sort of dipped in and out in work and, and different places and car events. Um, I was going to ask you um, where your journey started in terms of cars. What was the I mean, it's. I mean, I bet it's like yours, Mark, which is to say that it started at some indefinite point when I was very small. I mean, I'm, yeah, as you say, we don't know each other super well, but we've known each other for a long time. But I would bet that when you were, you know, still in shorts, so to speak, cars became an important thing in your life. And that certainly was for me, too. Uh, exactly what triggered it, I don't know. But essentially, I've been a, a car type, a car person, a petrolhead or whatever it might be from, you know, when I was five, I imagine. No? Is that not the same for you? Yeah, I, my dad was a, a Ford dealer. He ran a Ford garage, so I, I just grew up spending all my time sort of at the garage. And then when I got a bit older, I was washing cars on the forecourt, you know, when I was a little kid. He taught me to drive when I was 11. So I was driving back then would have been Mark I Cortinas. Wow. It used to freak people out. There'd be this little kid that could just see yeah, yeah. the, 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 I'm not the, surprised. the windscreen. Uh, driving cars around on the forecourt and then washing them. That was, yeah, yeah that Brilliant. was cool. Brilliant. That, that yeah, no, mine, mine doesn't have a specific thing like that, I suppose. I was massively into cars when I was a small kid. But actually, one of the sort of things which then leveraged it across to car design, and I don't know if you know this, but this is a mutual friend of ours, um, is that where I lived, um, just opposite, um, was uh, a friend of mine, and his dad was Peter Stevens. And there was this strange sort of phenomenon, which is that just through a childhood friendship, I got to know Peter a bit, and obviously, yeah, you know Peter too, uh, you know, the UK's perhaps most prolific car designer. Yeah. Um, and as a consequence, he knew that, you know, he, he, we, we talk sometimes, he knew that I had a, a level of car in my blood. Um, and just see, being exposed to bits and pieces of things that he was doing or involved with, like, you know, he, he was doing the Le Mans, the Cannes Le Mans team when yeah. I was there. Yeah. Um, and, you know, remember him running an early 924. So somehow through Peter, I became really aware of car design as a thing. And that really affected my sort of trajectory, I suppose, as well. That's very interesting. I didn't realise yeah. that. Yeah, so it's a strange yeah, he's, thing. He's, he's been sort of in my career all the time, like at Lotus and then at McLaren and even what we were talking about earlier with hot rods and that kind of thing. Yeah. I bump into him two or three times a year yeah. racing old Fords and that sort of thing. So, no. Oh, that's very interesting. Mm. So, no, so that was the sort of thing. And, and as a consequence, I was aware of him, you know, at the RC, being at the RCA. Um, and I don't know, it was just a thing in the peripheral awareness. And then, yeah, I just progressed and stayed in that, 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 that channel. Car design was where I was going to go, I think. I do love it. It's, uh, I always say it's such an incestuous world we're in. Everyone knows everyone and people kind of move around in those circles. So what, what was career-wise then? What, 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 is there an official first job in the car industry? Uh, well, I suppose so. So I was, you know, I think... Um, all the stories I ever hear about car design is essentially there's a luck involved in here. It's not just talent and, e and, and effort, even if there's always some of that in the mix. Um, and one of the lucky breaks for me was working um, what was then, I think, the largest UK-based R&D outfit for a car company, which was Deu. Now, Deu was based in Worthing, and Deu doesn't exist anymore. But at the time, it was like one of the, I think it was the 30th biggest company in the world. And they came into the UK market, that'll be the Deu. Um, and grew faster than any other car brand. And yeah, the R&D Centre for Europe was based just along the road from Brighton. Um, and it was a really cool place to be because, yeah, the brand was nothing to, to write home about. But as a consequence, um, we had much more clean sheet of paper. Uh, we had a fierce amount of programmes coming through. We were working at a Korean speed on everything. Yeah. Um, and there was a very young body of people there, massively involved in a huge amount of programmes. So, yeah, that was my lucky break. I was there as their design strategist, and I think oversaw sort of 26 programs in like less than three years. So it was really exciting. The, the downside, I guess, being that none of them fully came to, through to fruition. Um, but that's where I sort of became properly embedded in automotive. And then, yeah, from then took steps into consultancy and had a relationship with Car Design News as well. I was going to mention um, Dayu, I know, was IAD. Before, that's right, yeah, so it was like IAD. Yeah, and there was a lot of ex-IAD people still there, which yeah. is quite cool. And again, part of the incestuous industry i know lots of the guys some that were working here um and some at mclaren and previous places they've all been through the iad thing right. i think it was a real hub of yeah yeah, yeah. particularly like Katia guys UK. alias guys yeah. designers engineers yeah. all sorts so yeah that for the south of england i think that was a kind of a real nucleus wasn't yeah. it i think for, yeah for yeah design yeah so no an interesting place to be and then from then on yeah consultancy um and that's 
And that's actually how you, then you and I met, because I can't really remember the sort of specific point where we met. But as you say, the car design community has got this sort of soft edge to it anyway. So whether it's a, a degree show for the RCA or an auto show or something like that, we will have had mutual acquaintances way before we sort of first yeah. had our first conversation, whenever that was, Mark. Um, and then, yeah, as, in a consulting capacity, we did, did those tiny little things with you guys when you were at McLaren. Um, but yeah, for the most part, the work that we do is for, yeah, I mean, 95% of the work we do is for the design groups of car companies. Because that's what I was going to ask, for people that don't know, what, what's the sort of a, a day in the life yeah, well, of it's car very, design? Yeah, well, there's never one the same, which is the great thing about consultancy. Um, and it is very hard to put your finger on because essentially what we don't do is design a final solution for a car company. Um, but we do work predominantly with the design directors and the, I don't know, chief executive officers or the chief design officers, rather, of different car companies. And the majority of what we're doing is, is helping them establish, OK, what should this brand be in its design language? Uh, what should it be in its design intent? What should the portfolio be that represents that? What sort of vehicles should we be creating? How can we articulate and define that, but then actually do it in a way which the management team can buy into, the design team can buy into? How can we make that change and progress forwards? And yeah, essentially, how can design be more commercially uh, how can it be, contribute more to commercial success of the companies? So it's not the maths, it's not science or maths or, or just business, if you like. It is design side, but it's, it's this bit that sits in between. It's so hard to put your finger on. Um, but yeah, we're lucky that we've worked with, I guess, chief creative officers for um, Volvo Gili and for to Toyota and, I don't know, most of the big car brands, I suppose, um, normally at the top level. Um, and in a variety of projects which essentially are sort of summarised by what are they doing, where are they going, how is their future going to be um, and that still gets me out of bed in the morning with a skip if you see what I mean That's cool. um, and then there's a, other bits and pieces that we do which sit around if you like intelligence, you know we do a lot of stuff that sits in trend reports um, and actually interestingly um, with lockdown, I mean we, we, we you and I would see each other at every auto show and of course they don't happen now, although they do in China um, and we do uh, reporting, if you like, or create trend reports, which are, are often coming very much from auto shows. Yeah. But actually, increasingly, we're doing these things through Zoom now because the whole world is doing Zoom. Yeah. Uh, we're able to, through WebEx or Zoom or, or one of the other equivalent channels, speak to literally hundreds of designers around the world, presenting um, what's emergent in terms of design on an international level. So that it's slightly, it hasn't transformed our business, but it has had an effect, uh, the virus and, and the reduction in people's travel. And some of it's been positive because we're able to reach internationally so much more without getting on an aircraft. It's interesting, isn't it? Because the, the whole lockdown thing has just transformed the world in terms of the way we work, like you're just saying. Mm. It was interesting for us that we, we moved factories between lockdown, so we're in this new place now, the new HQ. Um, but we were still on and off working from home. And some of the guys are still working from home today. Uh, but it's been really interesting. It, it showed when you're in the digital stage how successful it can be, you know, being forced into that situation, just having Zoom calls with like 10 people on screen, but actually it becomes sort of second nature, it becomes yeah. fairly normal in yeah. the end. And, and we actually made really good progress. It was, it was more challenging, obviously, for the guys that were building development vehicles. You know, we had a tiny little skeleton team here, but we controlled it and managed it with all the COVID kind of restrictions in place. But on the design side, digitally, it, it kind of worked pretty well, to be mm -hmm. honest. And it's only when I'm, I'm so relieved, it's so nice today, shaking hands with you and seeing you from that, being able to talk face to face now. And I, I think most of us would prefer that anyway. Um, but yeah, I'm so much happier being back in the office now. But, it, but I was really shocked how it didn't stop us, it didn't slow us down too dramatically in yeah, terms of yeah, progressing yeah. with the design of the car. Uh, yes, it's, it's quite an interesting one. I find just what you do lose, it's a tricky one really, it's almost like the empathy and the, when you get especially challenging conversations, you know, if you're talking about serious business decisions, money related, timing related, all of the things that, you know, all of the, 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 more, the more difficult conversations that you have to have, I want to have that face to face. Yeah, yeah I, think there's, I think there's a lot also, isn't there, with design, which is so much of it's about nuance. And uh, for one thing, there's a need to somehow actually sort of see the product, feel the product, be next to it. You know, you can't just do all that through the screen. But I guess also, you know, when you're speaking with people as well, and it's all sort of subtle stuff about, you know, just nudging here and there and trying to understand how that's best accomplished, you do lose uh, a level of communication fluency, don't you, with, with Zoom? I can um, see. But I, I suppose actually the thing that I'm curious about, Mark, with, with COVID to some extent, it's like, 
broadly, everybody's gone from a world where their car experience is like kind of nine to five, Monday to Friday. And that the, the sort of whole car as a prosaic means of transportation is writ large. And you and I were talking about this a bit with, with you, just for yourself personally, you know, you getting into work and stuff. Now, I think people perhaps have had this sort of flip where actually maybe the car's role is, is, is there's a bit more of it, which is about the weekend, or maybe there's a bit more about it being less just a prosaic functional thing. Maybe there's more of it. I don't know if that speaks to charge. Is there a sort of shift in the way in which we see what the car is primarily that moves away from just the, the normal day-to-day. It's interesting, isn't it? Because we've, we, over lunch we were talking about this, we, we're both guilty of having weekend cars that put a big smile on your face and during the week you use a, a relatively sensible car that, you know, and that's, for me, that's where like an electric car or a hybrid car is like perfect. Driving on the M25, which is my commute now every day, you want something with all the creature comforts. For the first time, I've got a car that has technology. I'm so used to driving old school analog cars, which I love, but I've quickly got used to having, you know, controls, steering wheel controls. I know that sounds crazy, but I'm one of the last people to start embracing all of that. Um, and just all of it, and being able to talk, to talk to the car and, you know, change music and do things like that. It's not, these guys laugh at me all the time because I'm just used to driving like old school sports cars and, and you know, and that sort of thing, which I love. But I, I really get it. Now, I get that kind of mobile office thing, driving to work, mm-hmm. and I can see the logic in that. Uh, but I still personally struggle with a car that doesn't have a sense of occasion about mm. it. I, I really genuinely struggle with that. Maybe, maybe, I'm, uh, you know, maybe I'm sort of in the minority. I hope not. But it, I really still want that sense of connection you know, and the emotion with a car. I don't want to ever get in like a blob yeah, and, I mean, and drive to work or have the car drive yeah, me to work. Uh, it, it will happen one day. Yes, I have to accept yes. that. But yeah, I mean, I think in a way you and I know we're in a minority in that respect just because we're people that you know, love our motors and stuff. But then I, I do also sort of think, you know, or to, almost to some extent thinking, well, arrival kind of covers off the whole bus and, and uh, delivery logistics thing. That, that does the prosaic a bit. And then charge out there, kind of that is the weekend, isn't it? It's, it's almost like as a constellation, what you've got here in macro terms is your Monday to Friday normative solutions, which make a total load of sense. And then you've got the weekend thing. And, you know, I'm, I'm being a bit simplistic as I describe it to you, I suppose. Um, but there's a bit of me that thinks that when you look at the rest of the industry, the whole focus seems to be very much about chasing Tesla or purporting to do something which sits yeah. in that space, yeah. which is about sort of trying to replace yesterday's car with tomorrow's car. And it's very centred on, it's a car, you know, and, and, and maybe it's shared a bit, but to be honest, mostly it's just, it's a car, it's four wheels, it's kind of like does everything, it's replacing your, your internal combustion engine car with an electric car. And, you know, sure, that makes sense in a way. But I think what's potentially happening with your organisation is you're, you're not in the middle of there. You're at the bookends mm. of like the thing that you kind of don't need, but which is very exciting. And then actually, well, if you do need transportation, this is the logical way of doing it. Yeah. And actually seeing those two bookends and the way that obviously you're sharing sort of cleverness that sits in them technically, I find that quite an intriguing thing because most people are shooting in the middle, you know? Uh, I've said it lots of times and you just touched on it. Um, I'd make a terrible salesman because nobody needs an electric Mustang. Sure. <laughs> but, but it's such a it's such a great concept, and and it it does potentially tick the box for what you and I are talking about. In that, it does all the technology. Every, all the cars out there that I've driven, EV vehicles and so on, and hybrids, they've got great technology. But I haven't found many, or don't even think I have found one that I've got that connection with, or that I that really excites me. And yeah, there is this car is very is very cool. Without turning myself into the salesman. It, it is cool because it does combine the best of both worlds. You've got all of the technology, really good, cutting-edge technology. But then you've got this iconic car as well. That's mm. what attracted me to the place mm. in the first place. Um, and it, it should be the best of both worlds. Yeah. And it, you know, it will be the best of both worlds. When we, uh, yeah, I'm really curious to see how that works because it's quite a quick, exotic sort of mashup, isn't it? Um, but I, I guess almost saying the same thing that you've just said, but in a different way, is that actually a lot of the uh, sort of inverted commas exciting electric cars that we see at the minute, um, somehow they're still less exciting than the equivalent petrol version, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. I, I sort of feel like there's a quality where a lot of the um, electric cars that we see coming through are lesser versions in terms of an experience of what was before. Now, 
what you've got, and maybe there's a few other brands that are tipping the dough in it, but you can't see much evidence, is almost to compensate for the reduction in sort of, I don't know, emotive, visceral experience you get um, towards electric by dialing up some of the other qualities. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know, I'm very curious to see what your finished thing is and, and how that's, you know, how it, it feels. No, it, you're right, it's interesting. It, it, it almost feels like there's an unwritten rule book for electric cars that you that you mustn't be conventional. It has to look like an electric vehicle, whatever that is, or it has to look different, you, you know? And I do find that really strange. Yeah, it, it, it's driving a lot of benchmark cars that we've had has, has left me a bit cold, to be honest. Like I say, they're very, very capable, yeah. but I just get out of them feeling it's kind of something missing. Yeah, you know? I mean, one of the things that I do, I mean, you perhaps know, I mean, I teach at the Royal College of Art, and one of the things that I'm often picking up with um, when students are looking at this, and to some extent we have this as clients too, is that the electric car often is put there as a sort of solution set for, if you like, not having all the noise of an, ele- of, of an internal combustion engine or being easier than an internal combustion engine car in some respect. And if you like, it's presented as uh, a solution to some of the problems of electric. But what is not often presented is something which brings something new to the experience. Um, and I think that this sort of lessening quality that a lot of these electric vehicles have relative to a petrol vehicle yeah great novel it's not making any noise and that's fine and not just to pick up on noise but as a whole the ultimate experience is one that's lesser than the petrol equivalent Um, and I think that the industry hasn't fully yet recognized the need for them to if you like not just reduce the problem or or to uh, offer something which is very calm or or passive as an experience but to find a way of injecting something in there which is emotive quite visceral quite exciting uh, and not just to compensate, but also to complement the nature of its electrification to actually work with it, but in a positive adding to, not just in a reductive yeah. way. Um, and a lot of them do seem to be a bit reductive. And yeah, they have their place. But I'm like, the, I feel like the car companies are in, almost backing themselves into in a corner with experience. Mm. You know, they're going to make something which you can fall asleep in and just look at your tablet on. I'm like, well, how's that going to be? Why would you? Why would you aspire to owning something which is that bland? Yeah, exactly. Um, so. Yeah, I don't know. I know it's. I know you and I sort of coming at this conversation from the perspective of car people that enjoy silly things at the weekends with cars, but actually, I think that represents this sort of need to have some emotional engagement with vehicles, yeah. which is latent and should be for all people I, in I, a way. I still want a car to put a smile on my face, regardless. You know, even on a rainy day, I still want it to. I want to feel kind of special when I get inside it, not just like I'm getting on a bus or something. Mm-hmm. And it, it yeah, it, it, it's. It is quite a challenge. The sound thing you, you talked about is interesting. Everybody asks us, what's it going to sound like? What's the Mustang going to sound like? What is it going like? to sound like? <laughs> it's funny you should say that. I cannot wait to get in our current XP3 vehicle and have a drive in that and listen to it. Um, we haven't got full MVH um, fixed yet in that car, but I want to hear what what I would say, what you get for free yeah, in yeah. the car first. And it's again, you touched on it earlier, the, the, in my head, there's two kind of schools of thought. There's the glidey, wafty, kind of luxury vehicle that makes absolutely no noise at all, like a like an old school Bentley or a Citroen DS and things like that. Our car's a muscle car, you know, regardless whether it has a V8 or an EV powertrain in it, and and it and that changes the rules a little bit, I think. In yeah. that I wouldn't expect that car to be completely silent and glide along. So. I want to hear first what you get for free, mm-hmm. what, what uh, gearbox noise you hear, what mechanical noises you hear, even tyre noise you're going to sure. hear to a certain extent. And then we need to understand what we like, what we don't like. And, and you know, to be completely honest with you, is then, w- well, what I'm understanding is there's a legislation where zero to 20 kilometres an hour, we have to have an audible sure. sound. I suppose the equivalent of the man with the red flag walking yeah, in yeah, front yeah, of yeah. You know, the, the old car. So we have to do that. I think that the potential for that is to perhaps dial up the noise that we already get. Mm-hmm. I really, all of my kind of background says I do not want fake noise. You know, we don't want to create sure. a, a, a just a, a sound, you yeah. know, just some crazy sound for the car. It would be so wrong. Yeah. So see what we get for free, enhance that as yeah. required, uh, and that ticks the box for legislation then. But then, you know, I don't, I don't want to create... A, a synthetic, a completely no. false sound for the car. So once you get over 20 kilometres an hour, we can almost dial down that noise and go yeah. back to reality. Yeah. Or, you know, there are, there perhaps, I don't know yet, there perhaps going to be some some sounds that NVH is going to drone out, which is probably for the better. Sure. 
um, but we just need to yeah, you might see be what we get some first. Of, yeah, exactly. You can imagine that there's elements that you might be able to dial up. And I'm sensitive to the fact that a lot of car brands, I think, at this sort of first stage, and, you know, we've been pushing this a bit with some of our clients, have created brand-specific sounds, and that does make some sense. They're simulated. Um, but having said that, when they lack authenticity, it, it, maybe not everybody is going to be worried by that, but some shall be. Um, but then the other thing is you've got a sort of novelty where initially people might be, oh, wow, it's great that my... Fiat 500 sounds like a sort of funny symphony thing. But actually, after a while, I imagine that some people might find that to be a little grating, you know, or to, or to essentially lose its wow that was there for novelty because it's just always making that funny sound. Um, so I think the sort of self-consciousness is a component to that too. But there's also function. You know, if you hear certain some of the sounds that car, electric cars make, um, they make that noise, and it may have a sort of sound okay, sound nice fit with the brand, but if it doesn't fundamentally say to a pedestrian, uh, there's a vehicle moving towards you, it's not doing its job. So I think there's, there's quite a few things in the mix there, as well as the sort of actual sound that you're talking about too. Yeah, I don't, personally, I, I don't like giving the customer the options of being able to mess with stuff like that. Sure. It's like the same the same with lighting in your car. I've always hated the concept of you can have blue lights, you can have nightclub lights, you can yeah. have green. Please don't do that. You know, I, I yeah. don't want that. I'm the one that straight away says, where's the white light? I just yeah. want to, that's all yeah. I want. Yeah. And the same with, with the sound, you know, with a, yes, with a, with an internal combustion engine, you can put a, uh, you can put a sports exhaust on it. You can make it sound more aggressive. I quite like that. But other than that, you know, I don't want to be able to change anything and certainly with mm -hmm. an EV car again personally I don't like the idea of people being able to turn up the volume in effect mm -hmm. uh, that, it doesn't it doesn't it just doesn't seem honest yeah, to me yeah, and, yeah. and appropriate I know so what you mean I think yeah I mean the, the uh, it's fascinating you talking about sound there's a bit of me Mark that's like I don't know it's, it's, it can't be a we're not having a conversation here where you can just tell all sorts of secrets, but there's a bit of me, it's like, right, so they've, <laughs> they've decided to put a lot of resources into creating a, an organisation that can produce these immaculate 500, you know, electrified um, Mustangs, which is quite a unique thing. I mean, we've seen, you know, the sort of singer mould of taking an old car and, and bringing it up to speed and, and, and yeah. affecting things. Um, but you've, you've done that differently. You've got an electric thing. But actually, it's not just taking an electric governance and literally pushing it into a, an old car because you've totally had to redesign the thing. So there's, there's conceptually, you've got this old, classic, iconic design. You've got state-of-the-art, proprietorial electric gubbins. Um, and then you put it together in a kind of, you know, proper OEM, top-level quality way. That Those three things are quite distinct and I'm like well great but for me I'm like well, what, what, what's chapter two you could you know? almost be our salesman I'm loving all this. yeah <laughs> yeah that's chapter two I can't answer that one but the but all of the things that you've just been saying that what I love is the all of the the hardware and, and the software that it's all in-house it's all through arrival mm -hmm. through our technology partner um, all of that is easily transposable into the next vehicle so yeah. at the moment we don't have a, a skateboard as such but because we've we've integrated the batteries and the, all of that technology into the vehicle but we have like a rear frame like almost like a formula one car sure. with the inverters and the um, ev motors and so on but we can very easily then adapt that hardware into a mm. shorter wheelbase longer wheelbase wider track and, yeah. and so yeah. on so it, it just beautifully lends itself and we have four-wheel drive, independent all-wheel drive on the Mustang, but yeah, there's nothing to say we can't just have real-wheel drive sure. you know, on, a, on a particular car. Yeah. So, and at the moment, we're using this license shell, the Ford license shell. Uh, selfishly, at some point, I'd love us to just design our own. You know, yeah. we, could, we could create our own um, monocoque, our own shell, and so on, composite or aluminium, um, and do our own vehicle, if we like. But I think... The kind of the short answer to, to, to your question is we've got lots of other classics that we are talking about and arguing about. It's probably a better description <laughs> about what would be P2. Um, super exciting, yeah, because the, the hardware we, we know is adaptable. Yeah. Um, and it's just finding the right vehicle and the right, the right kind of niche and getting the volume right so we get the exclusivity and yeah. so on. Yeah. We never, certainly from my perspective, we never want to be a big volume. Sure. Um, supplier or an OEM it's it's more these kind of niche products uh, and again for me personally I think the smaller lower volume even better yeah. you know and do do uh, you know we could do 50 off 25 off and then we can move on to another one and then yeah, another yeah, one. And yeah. I think that 
Yeah, so, I mean, in a way, whilst you're, you're, the business that you are looking at right now is like making it happen for this Mustang, um, inherently the skills that are out there and that you're learning as this part of this process, you know, are going to be ripe for reapplication to, like you say, some other, I don't know what you would call it, but reapplication. Yeah, I love the idea of that. I think we bang a stake in the ground with Mustang, start delivering them the end of this year, and we send out a really strong message in terms of yeah. quality and exclusivity and so on. And uh, we have to earn, we've got to earn a reputation. Sure. You know, we're new, we're, we're still yeah, yeah, very yeah, much yeah, a yeah, startup. Yeah. So we've, we have to earn that reputation. And our first customers, you know, have to trust us on that mm-hmm. customer journey. Um, but I'm super excited about that, about getting those first customers' cars out. And, and actually, going back to the, the, the lockdown, the Zoom calls and so on, we've had the first, say, half a dozen customers, we've been doing the customer journey, you know, in that way. Um, again, it's much better to have them, say, in this room, talk to them and physically walk around a car yeah, and talk yeah. about the materials that are around us now yeah, yeah. And, and the options and so on. But we've had to do all that online, right? which is... It works, but it's, it's, it's not quite ideal. You, again, you don't get the yeah. that sort of um, you know that real, real proper face to face kind of human touch. But that's a that's a I'm really excited about that. As a, such a cool part of this this business is the customer journey. Yeah, it's kind of like you're a coach builder, really, isn't it? In the yeah. original sense of it, you know. Yeah. Um, so I remember we did some work for a client not that long ago. We we for one reason or another had to do a bit of homework, and one of the homework outputs was that within. London, uh, just over 100 years ago, I think I'm talking more like 110, 120 years ago, there were over 400 coach builders. And it's like the density of coach builders was just incredible. And now, well, clearly there aren't. But in some respects, you're kind of like the modern 21st century interpretation of, of you're not just that. But, you know, there's a I quality like where you have that. Yeah. I and like the bespoke that. experience as well. You know, when you, go and, when you go and have your, you know, your handmade shoe made, it takes four months. You go to have two fittings. I imagine that's a similar sort of thing that happens here with... Yeah, it will be. It will, and we've already, like I say, we've been doing it digitally. I cannot wait to start doing it physically, like with people coming in the building, which is starting to, you know, we're starting to get towards that position now. Um, No, it's 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 a really cool part of the journey. Yeah, and and I've said it before, like this car gives such opportunities for doing. It's so refreshing for me and for like Lisa, who looks after color materials. Um, We can offer stuff here that you couldn't possibly offer on a supercar. Sure. You know, the, the, just the nature of the car, just it, it gives such such opportunities to do more kind of lifestyle form mm-hmm. of a better mm-hmm. expression, mm-hmm. you know, stuff with materials. Yeah, it's 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 very cool. And we're just we're just starting to put the customer tiers together now in terms of the different levels of of like curated colour and materials. Right. But then of course you can go always go crazy. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. Go completely bespoke. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I hadn't realised that in a way the, the sort of trajectory for you will be to reapply this within potentially another established iconic type of design. Um, and you know, I guess to some extent the the, the, the catalogue of those goes on for almost forever, doesn't it? So that, that could be sustaining. There's a bit of me that'd be fascinated to think that there's also other ways in which you're sort of if you like your hardware like you said you know you guys could design your own vehicle but actually that might sit outside of the conventional idioms because you know just as as what you've got there with if i don't know if you call it the mustang but what you have is the mustang mm. you could argue that competes with sort of i don't know brand new lamborghinis and aston martins and stuff in, a, in its price point um but actually you know it competes with bits of art and, and boats and god knows what so actually i think there's opportunities conceivably to sort of conceive of new types of expression you know you're not bound by just having to be you know the next ferrari or mclaren or, or aston martin you know that i think there's this potential with your technologies and the competencies here to conceive vehicles which is outside of the known stuffs um, and that's the thing that really intrigues me i suppose we, we've talked about we, I, I put a little telegram group together with the guys like the design team the engineering team just to, when we started talking about project two just to get some ideas, and we're just posting pictures, and it just went crazy. You can imagine we're all like you and me. We're like we're all twelve-year-old schoolboys at heart, and all sorts of images. And it was like, oh my god, look at that one! Look at this! I've forgotten about that. So many vehicles that you could do, and some of them instantly you think, yeah, that's cool, but that's yeah. never going to happen. Yeah, that's yeah, never going to yeah, happen. Yeah. Oh, hang on a minute, that one's cool. And then you start looking at it and think, yeah, that would work. You could do rear-wheel drive. You could put batteries there. That might be a bit challenging here, but yeah, I think we could make that work. And, yeah, it was very, very cool. Mm. And then the other thing, without giving too much away, <laughs> even cars that never actually made it onto the road, concept right. cars, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, d- those sort of design studies and things that everyone went crazy about and then a few years later said, why didn't they ever do that? 
you know, and that would be interesting too. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and, and uh, so there's lots of ones like that, I suppose, that we can think of, which sort of sit in the yesteryear, but half of them are from Italy, aren't they, Mark? But <laughs> um, I'm, we were involved with, and it's still probably a project I'm one of the most proud of, of the O21C Volvo show car, well, not show car, concept car from three years ago, which is this autonomous pod. And I mean, you know, you could say it's, con- it's consistent with other autonomous pod type show cars that we've seen from Renault and other brands. Um, but again, I'm sort of thinking, well, what you've got is this unprecedentedly competent base competency base to actually realize vehicles which could be like that you know they may not just be vehicles which speak of of, of something from the past they yeah. might be ones which literally offer a different proposition you know vehicles which maybe have autonomous quality but even without that they could be designed you know for this low volume production maybe it's a car for i don't know hilton hotels to just do the 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 um the run from their yeah. hotels to heathrow yeah um that would be totally different to anything which exists at the minute because everything that exists at the minute is, is within the old 20th century idiom of what a car is. Yeah. Um, so I think there's all sorts of encycli- exciting ingredients that I see you've got that are like, wow, you could do these things as well. I see in my mind, just you saying that, is it the Peninsula Hotel that had, there's the classic picture with all the Rolls Royces yeah. and things. Yeah. And, they, and they did it in the old days with the original Rolls Royces and now with a whole bunch yeah. of phantoms all yeah. colour coordinated and so on. Yeah, it's quite, yeah, the thought of something quite specific or dedicating a series yeah. of cars for a particular purpose. Yeah, 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 exactly. And I mean, there's also this sort of idea, and it's one that other people have talked about, I suppose, where actually the idea of a vehicle that's not necessarily about high performance, but which actually could be, you know, super low speed, but actually you use it much more for a sort of social meeting or work meeting type of thing. So it's almost conceptually like a bit of architecture which happens to move. Again, it's probably not sort of on the drawing board for tomorrow, but um, I'm mindful that in terms of getting to that point where it could be realized um increasingly don't believe that the incumbent car companies have the scope to sort of conceive or think about those sorts of things whereas the nature of your organization i feel like are much more likely to be able to explore that or consider it as a feasibility you know you you, you're coming at it from a different sort of um set of ingredients um whereas i think the majority of people are still very much centered on car you know and the the normal car space it's funny it's you saying that has literally just reminded me in a previous life a previous company i remember we did a nobody had asked us to do it but we were looking at some concepts and ideas and for our our old ceo we did a i think i don't know what we called it the city pod or something like that but it was basically when he lands in his learjet at the airport this this vehicle autonomously parks itself next to the plane. So as he walks down the steps, the, the, the canopy pops open and it's a one man pod. He puts his briefcase, snaps into the side. You know, it was completely designed around him. And, uh, and then he drives off in his kind of hermetically sealed, you know, but a really beautiful, stylish, cool mm-hmm. thing that takes him to his meeting venue or takes him back to the hotel or whatever and yeah, then waits yeah. for him before he wants to go out. And yeah, the, seems very sci-fi or whatever but it's not really is it it's no. it's it's just around the corner it's relatively doable yeah 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 yeah, yeah that's quite a uh, that's funny bringing back that memory on a on a much lighter note then <laughs> what um I'm, I'm just thinking say with cars what what was your first car um well yeah I don't know. I think often first car's blurred, isn't it? Because like many people, I learned to drive in, in my parents' cars and stuff. So those sort of sit in my mind. But the first car I actually owned was um, unusually, I think, even for, for, for the day, was uh, the original Fiat 500 I had. And also the one I, oh, had, nice. was, the one I had was kind of um, a light orange, so kind of like a, a, an egg yolk colour. Um, and uh, yeah, such a pretty thing. I mean, it was actually quite poor condition, the one I had, but that was a really exciting car. If a car that only does 55 miles an hour can be exciting. <laughs> I um, love them. But it's just so small. I mean, and also I live in Cambridge and I lived in Cambridge at the time and, and it was so small, you could fit through the sort of streets which were bollarded up so that only cyclists could fit through. I could just about squeeze through those in, in my Fiat 500. you one of those giant gutters in Cambridge. Yeah, yeah. I mean, properly small, such a small car <laughs> and so full of character. So yeah, I love that. And the one I had was, because of this colour, it's the only car I've ever driven where everybody seems to have a welcome response to it, you know. Um, old, old people, young people, small kids, whatever, they will wave at you and stuff. So actually having a car which has that sort of joyousness to it, some immediate positivity, uh, was really, really wow. So it's almost still missed that, actually, Mark. Uh, uh, it's, it's interesting as well. It's something we were talking about earlier in size of cars as well. Uh, looking at, even out in the car park, Taycan in the car park, mm. and the, um, 
Cayman, uh, Cam Panameras and those sort of cars. They're also a bit in the Audi, Massive. RS e-tron and those cars. Again, fantastic vehicles, mm. but everything's so big. Mm. And we still need, I, I need, I want a smaller car. I mm. just want a smaller EV vehicle um, to drive around in. And uh, yeah, the, the Mustang is a nice footprint as well. I think proportion wise, it's not too big. Everything that, everything I see coming out seems to be bigger and bigger and mm. bigger, which, uh, yeah, I'm never, never particularly comfortable with that. Smaller cars are always good. Yeah, it's funny with the Fiat, looking at when you look at the contemporary one and the one that you're talking about, and same with Mini and all of those cars. We, I remember years ago at Lotus when we did when we were looking at the new Elan, we had some benchmark cars and we had we had an old Elan, an original beautiful old um, I think Series Three Elan, and then a, the Miata, the MX-5 yeah, yeah. had just come out. Yeah. And we parked that next to it as well, and suddenly the Miata, which is a tiny little jewel of a car. Huge. It looked enormous yeah. you know, next to the next to the old Elan. It's so funny, isn't it? How you get used to the proportion. It's like a, a Volkswagen Golf now. When you look at a Series One Golf, a beautiful size and proportion, and you so look at one now, there's an enormous. Vehicle. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, there is a, a sort of generally a migration towards larger cars, particularly I think width. Uh, I mean, the Golf one is intriguing, isn't it? Because originally, you know, the Golf was this sort of thing which is I think shorter than um, I was going to say the Lupo. It's not the Lupo, is it? Than the Up. I think it's shorter than the Up even. Um, but it's a properly, wow. you know, it was a properly small car. But then you've got this sort of ascent. So, you know, when you and I were first engaged with cars, you could maybe get a Fiesta, but then that's got bigger and bigger and bigger. And then they bring in a Ford car. So there's a sort of migration of the mm. car getting bigger, and then they bring in a smaller one uh, that sits next to it. But I, I, I think you're right that size is relative, isn't it? So we talk about a small car just because it's smaller than the, the larger cars around it. It's just become the norm of cars. People accept the size of them. They're, they're big cars, and you need parking sensors. You need all those driver aids and things because... Yeah can't see over anything yeah yeah, yeah yeah but then actually also when we were younger the majority cars that were around us would be british eurocentric whereas now it's such an international marketplace so you know the audis that we all we know about yeah they're that size partly to fit the states the appetite they have there so i think there's a an internationalization which happens uh, on the scale of cars which is sort of you know another yeah, factor yeah. behind how come they've grown people talk about legislation and crash and i know that's a factor um, but I think it's 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 just a sort of an organic growth that people want more, manufacturers can do more, and so it just happens naturally. But there is something, I think, that you miss about the small scale of something like a Fiat 500 or the original Mini. Um, it's so much more, uh, you're so much more connected and aware of your surroundings and the, and yeah. the road and so forth. It is quite that, a purest thing. That was my first one, a, uh, a Mini. an 850 Mini, yeah, which... Yeah, again, when I see one on the road now, I get so excited because they look tiny, don't they? So it's the same as the, with the Fiat 500. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was there a, maybe a last question, because we're probably almost out of time, um, like a milestone car, like a real game changer? Is there something that still sticks in your mind? As I know you said you recently sold your 928. Yeah, well, I mean, I've, I think I'll always have a soft spot for 928s. And like I said to you, that I sold it, and it felt like I cut a limb off because <laughs> I still miss it very much. And actually, it fits with the story we were talking about earlier. People in, back in the day, 928 are some massive thing. It's like uh, slightly smaller than a 997 Porsche. Thanks very much. You know, it's not a massive car. It's the size of a new 911 or a bit smaller, you know. Yeah. So things have got bigger. But yeah, no, I miss that very much um, because it's such a sort of clean fresh purest thing um and i don't know i enjoyed being able to track it sometimes taking it on very long runs sticking a bicycle in the back of it putting the kids in the back you know what i mean it could do everything um and just the technical ingredients this because that because that was like almost brave new world for porsche wasn't it they thought that was the future the, yeah the v8 you know with the and the, the front engine and the whole that luxury Kind yeah, of thing. yeah, yeah, yeah. But it never really took off, did it? No, it never did the sales. I mean, obviously, it cost a fierce amount of money, and it never had invert commas the character of a 911, did it? So it wasn't ever going to speak to the sort of original Porsche cognoscenti, I think. And obviously, it was blighted by you know fuel crisis, and the early ones were not as powerful as they should have been. Mm. Um, and yeah, they were very expensive machines. And I think also at the time, they somehow sat in a funny place where they straddled a sports car and luxury car. They were neither mm. fish nor fowl. So I think that people coming to them didn't sort of, it wasn't an easy navigation to get there. I think they actually, in a way, fitted the market more in the 90s than they did in the 70s when they were first out there. Um, but yeah, I think I would always have a, 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 a great affection for those things. And anything, um, was there a real 
was there a sort of dream car that you never got your hands on or something? Else? Um, or well, you know, not yet. I don't know. I, I, I mean, it's, I still find reference points with cars so challenging, Mark, because, I mean, maybe, <laughs> you know, like you and I are speaking, we hadn't seen each other for a while, and suddenly there's a little chapter that's opened up in your sort of whole lexicon of cars. You're like, oh, wow, Mark's gone pre-war. And I am swear <laughs> if I spoke to you about that five years ago, that would have been like, well, that wouldn't have been there. So I think there's something exciting with cars where because there's so many different chapters and flavours and varieties and nationalities and types and God knows what, mm. that actually there's always something out there that might be the thing. There's no definitive, oh, yes, this one here. I mean, most recently, for example, I was just reading about Hudson's, the immediate post-war Hudson's. I'm like, wow, I never knew about those. Suddenly I have a desire to get a sort of post-war Hudson. I don't think I will. But, um, yeah, no, I don't know. I think it's a constant thing, isn't it, Mark, of, of, of new it, things to find out? Being here, it's definitely, you know, I've always liked American cars and, and hot rods and old school cars, but now looking at, looking at the Mustang on a daily basis, there are so many kind of 60s muscle cars and cool cars, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, from the States that uh, some of them have still survived, you know, and when you see people that are doing kind of sympathetic restoration. Yeah, them, yeah, that just that amazing. Would, that would and actually, people forget, but the Americans really were, you know, leading automotive design in the 60s and 70s. Well, certainly the 50s and 60s. You know, there's some such fine things coming through there, real sophistication. It's, it's, um, yeah, it's true. I, some of it, some of it, I, in terms of styling in inverted commas, some of it I, I forgive and I absolutely love and kind of embrace. Other bits of it I just struggle to come to terms yeah, with. Yeah, but, yeah. but some of those kind of cleaner muscular sort of late 60s cars yeah. you know it just um, yeah they look just so, so cool. amazing yeah. yeah yeah very interesting yes sam thanks so well, much well thank you mark time. good to be here yeah, it's yeah. good to catch up it's good yeah. to learn a bit more about yeah. you well nice to and, be uh, it'd be great to get you back sometime when uh, towards the end of the year when we've got mm. a production car mm. to show yeah you. i'd be very curious to see come and have a drive thank and, you uh, i will i will yeah thanks mark thanks appreciate again. it